in the late 1950s, Gus Alex came to the attention of the media, at least in Chicago, and they called him a globe-trotting gangland sportsman because he made what he called skiing trips to Switzerland on a really steady basis over the years. Uh, actually, what he was doing was depositing cash for the mob bosses and so forth in numbered bank accounts. Uh, in other words, bank accounts as opposed to bank accounts with names. And they, these numbers were codes, and you had to match them up to get the cash. The Swiss were notorious. Actually, they still are notorious for not asking any questions about anything. Fairly recently, they found um, Nazis had stolen painting and jewelry and so forth. They were found in secretive bank accounts over there. He began making these trips in 1939. He continued them until the late 1960s. And then he wrote them all off on his IRS things as a ski trips. He said he had been there skiing. Eventually, the FBI figured this out. In 1965, they sent a slew of agents over to Europe and filled in the police on who Alex was and what he was probably doing. And now the, the, the Swiss don't want any problems. They just want, they want the whole thing quiet. And they were happy to get rid of this guy. So when he showed up, the Swiss police turned him around, put him back on the plane, and barred him from the country for 10 years. He wasn't going to take that lying down. He called in favors. And Illinois Senator Everett Dirksen, who I used to like, I thought he was a great guy, and Congressman William Dawson, who defines corrupt, my God, uh, they wrote letters on his behalf saying he's a fine human being. He's never been convicted of a crime, which was more or less true, and there's no reason not to let him into the country. Um, Dawson and Dirksen both said they, they just didn't remember writing any letters like that at all. But the the Swiss uh, embassy had the letters, and they gave it to the State Department. The State Department turned it over to justice. So they showed him the letters. And they said, ah, he said, I still don't know what this is about. I've never heard of this guy. The police assumed that the reason that Alex was in the spotlight so much, the press was looking for a replacement for Jake Guzik. He died in 1956. They figured this is our guy. And in a way, he kind of was. He took over all the loot betting rooms, the policy gamblings in the loop. He lived like a king. He lived in a luxurious 10th floor apartment at 4300 Marine Avenue, those wonderful round buildings. He was uh, overlooking the lake. He owned a succession of baby boo sports cars, foreign made, domestic made. He sent sizable donations to Chicago's theater. You know, like Murray Humphreys, he was trying to pass himself off as this cultured guy. And so, and he made huge contributions to uh, cultural good causes and that sort of thing. A lot of that was because of his wife uh, at the time, Mary Ann. He met her at a fashion show in 1944. Uh, for her sake, he limited his contacts, his social life with his mob friends. Uh, FBI reports that on several occasions, they were the couple were out to eat. A mob guy would walk up and say hi and uh, uh, Alex just gave him a cold shoulder. He didn't want him, he didn't want his wife mixed up in that world. Uh, he credited Marianne for turning his life around. She turned him into a skiing enthusiast. So he said, I I find that hard. I, if, I guess if I saw a picture of him skiing, I'd believe it. During the time he was with her, he shed 20 pounds. He remained at a muscular 174 pounds. She coached him into sleeping a few hours a day. He was out of bed by 7 every morning. And remarkably, he went jogging uh, with an army of FBI guys behind. In 1968, he dumped Marion for this tall, blonde German woman. She had been a model as well, called Dittgard Fugers. What a name. The public didn't know what Gus Alex looked like, and he, he wanted it that way. You know, this generation, this newer generation at that time of gangsters, they saw what had happened with guys like Guzik and Al Capone and who were known to the public, and it's not good. So they wanted to lay it low. And to do that, when he was called before the Kefauver Commission, which would be televised, he went to his wife's hairdresser, and she cut his hair in a style that had been popular in Europe in the 1930s. This, um, really, there's a photo of it here where they trim it really close up by the skull. Uh, so he looks ridiculous. And then he went to a Michigan Avenue uh, glasses shop, and they designed a special pair of glasses to him that were way too big, black glasses, uh, sunglasses, sort of. And he did that on purpose. The reasoning was people would be focused on his ridiculous haircut, 
and on these insane glasses he was wearing, which were huge, too big for his face. And they wouldn't focus on what he looked like. He also went out of his way to dress like everyone's version of a gangster when he was appearing before that committee and the other committee. You know, slightly shiny suits, that sort of thing. Cheap material. He, like Humphreys, though, was actually an Anglophile, and he sent for his suits from from London. Uh, and they were fine, imported wools and that sort of thing. Before he got banned from the banks, Alex had been in Switzerland with his wife, and they were near St. Moritz. Uh, the next morning, they hopped on a plane back to Chicago. The plane was landed in Idlewell Airport, what used to be Idlewell Airport, in New York, and Alex was told to deport, get off the plane. And when he did, uh, there was a gang of customs guys there, and they grabbed him, and they put him into one of these customs holding rooms, which, if you've ever been in these things, they're scary. There's no windows. There's a table and two chairs and a door that, when it shuts, it's a uniform with the wall, so you get the feeling you're in a, a box, you know? How do I know? <laughs> uh, I, on my way from Peru, I was called in with a group of 10 Germans, and they assumed... I was. We were the only white people on the plane of about I don't know, eighty people, and we, you know, I'm pink, pink, pink person, and I guess they just assumed I was one of them, and they held me in, and they tried to get me to speak German and all kinds of stuff. I don't know what the Germans did. My guess would be they were uh, political types, probably. There was a lot of problems down there at that point. Anyway, the customs people they strip searched him, which you can imagine. Alex has this enormous ego. When they strip searched him, they found a large money belt around his waist. They took it. It had 10000 in cash. Uh, he refused to answer questions about the cash. The IRS later came to his house and they asked more questions about that money. They said, did you get it from your first ward bedding room in your policy room? They asked him about his relationship with Frank Strongy Ferraro, who was his gambling manager for the Roof stuff, and Nathan Butch Layden, L-A-D-O-N, who was his driver. Um, he refused to answer any questions. Also, having the cash, I don't know if it's still the case, seems like it w would be illegal now, but it wasn't illegal. I guess his theory was, I left with the 10000 in cash and coming back with the 10000 in cash. So back at the airport, he completely lost his composure when the customs guys took his suitcases and his wife's suitcases and dumped them on the floor of the airport and they demanded proof of purchase for the items he was bringing back, things he said he bought. Uh, they cataloged everything that was in the suitcases, and they charged him with additional duty taxes for several of the items. Two and a half hours later, he was allowed to get back on a plane, uh, and he was livid. 